Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to these new ground rounds of the academic year 2021. Today, in this uh, inaugural ground rounds, we have uh, Dr. Dillis Walker presenting the results of uh, her outstanding project in East Africa on preterm birth study done in Rwanda, Uganda, and Kenya. Professor Dillis Walker is a full professor at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. She is the director of the Maternal, Neonatal, and Child Health uh, Cooperative at the Institute for Global Health Sciences. She obtained her medical degree at the, the University of California, San Diego, and did fellowships at the University of Pennsylvania, and also here at UCSF. I had the distinct pleasure of uh, recruiting Dillis and her husband, Stefano Bertossi, to Mexico. Time ago, they spent uh, 11 years working, and that is where um, Dillis created or co-founded uh, the notion of pronto that we will be learning about. So um, I think uh, this uh, study that has been published in Lancet Global Health, as you will see soon, is uh, one of the most critical contributions to understanding um, stillbirths, neonatal mortality, and interventions to deal with reducing those. So without uh, further ado, uh, let me ask uh, Tillis to make her presentation. Great, thanks so much, Jaime. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. And as I understand, this is the inaugural IGHS Grand Rounds for this uh, academic year. So it is a real honor to be sharing this with you. I'm presuming that there are many um, new students on the line and I just wanna have a, give you all a warm welcome. And hopefully over the next hour or so, I will get you all very excited about maternal, newborn, quality of care and um, at least give you an opportunity to think about this general topic area in a little bit differently. So I'm gonna to talk to you about the um, preterm birth initiative work. Um, I'm gonna give you an overview of PTBI East Africa and spend a little bit more time diving into the Kenyan Uganda um, intrapartum package study we did and the group antenatal care project in Rwanda, both of which have been completed. And I just wanna tell you a little bit about the journey of both of those studies and where they stand. I can't really begin this um, without acknowledging uh, the importance of our in-country uh, principal investigators, dear friends of mine now who I came to know through the preterm birth initiative, uh, Dr. Peter Weiswa, who is um, renowned regionally, where we share a uh, position on a WHO advisory committee. He's a public health physician and um, really leads the maternal newborn child work in Uganda at Makerere University. Falgona Otieno, who is a pediatrician at Kemri in Kenya, uh, led the work in Kenya. And Sabine um, Musange, who was the uh, principal, pr uh, principal investigator in Rwanda. Again, all of this work is really um, thanks to their commitment and um, efforts on the ground. So I think um, I just wanna set the stage so that when I talk about some of these things, you all know exactly what we're talking about. Um, some of the terms that we use are things like um, fresh stillbirth, neonatal death, perinatal death and preterm birth and gestational age. I'm just gonna very quickly describe those. So when we talk about fresh stillbirth, and um, there is quite a bit of discussion about probably some of the insensitivity involved in these terms, but in um, registries, national registries, global registries, you tend to separate what we call fresh stillbirths 
from macerated stillbirths. And overall, both of them are your entire stillbirth rate. Fresh stillbirths are stillbirths that are recent and thought to be due to things that happen during labor and delivery that result in a baby that is not alive at birth. Neonatal death refers to death of a newborn before 28 days of life. Perinatal death is a combination of stillbirths and neonatal deaths up to one week. Okay, so that's what is sort of traditionally called a perinatal death that combines stillbirth and newborn deaths. Preterm birth are babies that are born before 37 weeks gestational age. And gestational age is the term we use to um, date a pregnancy, the number of weeks of gestation that have passed. I just want to give you a very brief um, grounding in how I came to be doing this work and give you a, a, a few sort of comments about who I am and why I do this work. Uh, as Jaime mentioned, I spent 11 years working with him and the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico, which was really core to the work I'm doing now. But I think that the, the, the spark came far earlier than that when I was a medical student and took a year off work, um, did what many might think of as medical tourism back then or now. Um, and I like to think that I am giving back in my ways currently. But I think back to being at a small um, hospital in Karatina, Kenya, where I would spend the evenings. Um, there were many nights that I would, a knock would come on our, our little hut where we as the medical students stayed and the guard would come and accompany me to the labor and delivery ward where I would care for the women there. And it didn't take long for me to recognize that I was certainly not the most competent person to be taking care of mothers during labor and delivery. And that if I looked around the hospital where I was working, the labor and delivery unit tended to be the most crowded, the dirtiest, um, the least well staffed. And those disparities in care and the provision of care, not only around maternity services, but also about reproductive health in general, really um, became something that I felt was um, important to address. And that sort of is the core to how I got to what I'm doing. Um, overall, the preterm birth initiative um, is work that has five aims. I'm not going to go into them, but in addition to the two studies that I'm going to tell you about today in Kenya and Uganda and the other one in Rwanda, there was also a big effort to do capacity strengthening through a fellowship program, a small grants program to early career researchers in Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda. But today I'm really going to focus on the Kenya and Uganda work. So in Kenya and Uganda, um, we conducted a, an implementation trial that is, we refer to as the Intrapartum Quality Improvement Package. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what you need to know with regard to preterm birth and some of the story as to how we landed on what we're doing. But if you look at um, deaths among children under five, you can see that 45% of those occur in the neonatal period or during those first 28 days. And if you dive in a little deeper to that part of the pie chart, you'll see that 15% are preterm, due to preterm birth and another 10% due to these, what we call intrapartum or things that happen during labor and delivery that result in either a neonatal death and a neonatal death. So given that burden, um, combined with this, um, uh, the Every Newborn Action Plan, which came out um, right around the time that we were planning this big initiative. And what it really said was, you know, this is a complex slide, but if you focus on that red box, you can see that um, at its core, the Every Newborn Action Plan was promoting in, if, if we could simply improve skilled care at birth and essential newborn care, both at the first level of care and the referral level of care, um, working on improving use of practices that we already know work, so evidence-based practices that are not being implemented routinely, we could probably save three million lives each year. And this was really core to why we decided on an implementation trial that tried to look at more of 
the how to get providers to do what they know they should and could do um, rather than uh, new technology or a new um, anything else new around preterm birth. We really wanted to improve the quality of care and our in-country partners really insisted that even though they appreciated preterm birth was important, their experience was that there were so many mothers and newborns dying that it was really important that whatever intervention package we chose had the potential to benefit all mothers and babies, um, even if we were just measuring its impact on preterm infants. So what did we do? We conducted what we call as a pair matched cluster randomized controlled trial where we had 20 public sector facilities, 16 of those were in Migori County in Kenya, and four of those were in the Basoga region. You can see what their comparative neonatal mortality rate was, stillbirth rate, and preterm birth rate, which are representative of the region and globally, they represent significant burden. They're not the highest and certainly they're not the lowest by any means. And there's um, lots of uh, room to improvement in order to meet, meet the sustainable development goals. So we had these 20 public sector facilities um, where we pair matched them um, to a, a similar facility and half of them were randomly assigned to the intervention package and half of them um, were just followed. What was our hypothesis? We felt that by carefully selecting this intervention package, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that, um, we hypothesized that by doing this intervention package, we would reduce the combined incidence of fresh stillbirth and neonatal mortality among preterm infants by 30% compared to the control group. Now, for an implementation trial, which really looked at sort of real world settings, this was very aspirational. Similarly, um, I wanna draw attention to the neonatal mortality. We didn't look at perinatal death. We didn't look at just those deaths in the first seven days. Um, we were pushed to look at the impact of this up to one month of life. And the reason for that was you could imagine if you do a lot of focus on improving care for these small vulnerable infants around the time of birth, you may well be able to keep them alive for that period that they would have potentially died previously, but you send home these vulnerable babies that they may in, in fact have um, greater mortality after they go home and in the end have no net result. So we pushed it to neonatal mortality. Our theory of change was that by implementing this interpartum intervention, um, we would strengthen uh, routine data systems, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, quality of care around the time of birth, and decrease um, prematurity related um, mortality. So this just gives you a little bit of a snapshot as to what the settings were like um, representative. Uh, we're talking about um, records, um, systems, storage mechanisms, in which people didn't really appreciate or understand the importance of record keeping, data keeping. Busy, busy maternity wards with often um, more than one woman to a bed um, and few uh, resources were really strapped in terms of human resources, number of midwives, physicians, and nurses. And finally, you often see um, preterm infants, infants that are sick having to share spaces and um, for many reason, not getting the optimal attention they might have received. Again, we took this situation and decided we're not gonna introduce new methods of providing um, supplemental oxygen, supplemental feeding, or other um, specific things. We were gonna try to strengthen the system around labor delivery and birth with a focus on these preterm infants. So what was the intervention package? So remember I said we had 20 facilities and in this trial, there actually is not a pure control. So in this trial, um, all of the facilities received what we call the data strengthening and introduction of the modified safe childbirth checklist. And then our, our intervention facilities received in addition to those two interventions, quality improvement collaboratives, and the Pronto Simulation and Team Training Program modified for preterm birth. 
So what does this actually mean? Data strengthening, um, we focused on improving documentation of recording, particularly in maternity registers. So we decided we would rely on what the midwives write down in that maternity register, recognizing the benefit of strengthening those data for decision making and get the, the, the providers that work in these settings to look at and believe the data and the documentation that they are doing and recognize the importance. The modified safe childbirth checklist, some of you may have heard of the safe surgery checklist, which is a checklist that was developed by Atul Gawande and has been shown to improve um, outcomes for surgical patients. The, Atul Gawande and others modified that, that checklist from surgical care to labor and delivery and created the safe childbirth checklist. We modified it to reinforce practices around preterm birth, particularly in terms of identifying preterm labor and um, strengthening immediate newborn care of those small babies. Quality improvement collaboratives. Um, this is a movement that has sort of taken hold across the world where you have um, quality improvement teams that choose key indicators for their facilities and in our case it was around things like documenting gestational age, using uh, steroids for pulmonary, um, lung, pulmonary maturity um, among preterms and they take the data, look at it, identify bottlenecks and propose things to change within the facility that will improve care and improve that particular indicator. And then finally, so again, the, the intervention facilities got the QI collaboratives and they got this pronto simulation and team training. Uh, pronto training is really all about creating highly realistic simulation, setting up safe spaces for doctors, nurses, any of the providers who are forced to deal with these simulations in strapped settings to practice. Um, improve their teamwork and communication and learn how to optimize the care in situations that are rare and that practicing and discussing and really learning how to work together can transform the outcome of those um, patients. You can see that the intervention was rolled out in a very real world setting in Kenya and Uganda from 2016 to 2019. In the middle of it, there was a national nursing strike in Kenya. Um, we can talk about that later, um, but there's all sorts of things that happen in these settings that can sometimes get in the way of um, an effective trial, but are also the realities of doing this kind of work. So let me tell you a little bit about some of the results. Um, our process data, so this is data that we collected throughout the course of the implementation to get a sense of were things going in the direction we were hoping them to because we may or may not have had impact on our primary outcome, which was neonatal mortality and stillbirth, but we wanted to see along the way also be able to document process data. So you can see in the far left side of yellow, we saw how many, a couple of the indicators around data strengthening. Uh, we increased the completion of key maternity fields, recording of gestational age. Um, in the middle columns, we have the process results for Pronto, where we showed there was an overall increase in knowledge around topics related to preterm birth and general obstetric emergency. The simulation practices, we actually take uh, the videos of the simulations that were done in the field and we code provider behaviors in particular sin clinical scenarios to see if they perform as they were taught to do and as they would be expected to do. And we saw over time, um, similarly improvement in their practices. And then finally, um, the QI indicators, uh, the QI indicators that were probably most relevant to this were uptake of KMC and that's kangaroo mother care where preterm and um, low birth weight infants are placed immediately skin to skin with the mother and swaddled there. Um, for growth and that improves their survival. And the other is the use of antenatal corticosteroids to accelerate pulmonary lung maturity. And you can see these were our process indicators. And what I'm gonna show you next is what was our primary outcome. 
So again, the combined fresh stillbirth, our primary outcome was combined fresh stillbirth and neonatal mortality among preterm infants. Which were the preterm infants? How did we define what babies were eligible to be followed? Those were fresh stillbirths or live births that had a birth weight between 1,000 and 2,500 grams. So any baby less than 2,500 grams has a high likelihood of being preterm. And then there are a whole proportion of preterm babies that are under 3,000 grams that have a recorded age of less than 37 weeks. And if you're interested later, we can get into that. Why didn't we just say any baby with a recorded age less than 37 weeks? And why do we have this very interesting um, approach to how we decided which babies were pre most likely preterm? And then we did an intention to treat logistic regression adjusted for pairing uh, with robust standard error estimates to get um, the results. Um, I'm not going to go in detail of this, but I just wanted to show you the, the sort of consort diagram where you can see that we had 20 facilities that were pair matched, 10 got the intervention, 10 got the control, and at the bottom we followed about 1,500 babies in both the um, intervention and control facilities. These are babies that met eligibility criteria and that we assessed them for both mort neonatal mortality to 28 days or if they were still birth. And what did we find? We found that this full intervention package reduced the combined fresh stillbirth and neonatal mortality among these preterm infants by 34% compared to the cold control group. And I must say, we were ourselves quite surprised by the strength of this result. Um, what does that actually mean? If you look at that outcome, um, among all those eligible babies born in control facilities, 23% of them were either stillborn or died by 28 days. If those eligible babies were born in intervention facilities, that proportion decreased to only 15% of them were either stillbirth or neonatal deaths. Um, this reduced mortality odds is significant and you can see our primary outcome that is in has the red box around it, but it was consistent across all outcomes, fresh stillbirth alone, pre-discharge mortality, 28-day mortality, perinatal mortality. So um, we feel very confident in this finding that it wasn't a sort of spurious finding that there was a difference between intervention control. We really do believe that this intervention package um, acted to save lives. Um, the trends were also consistent by country. You can see in purple is Uganda and yellow is Kenya. Um, the overall contribution was definitely larger in Uganda. Those were um, larger facilities that had um, a greater delivery volume. They were doing cesarean sections. And again, there's some interesting things about um, what happens in facilities of, with different types of characteristics. So our interpartum package showed benefits. It had some limitations. Um, I've already mentioned gestational age. There are issues about referrals before delivery. So um, part of the trial was to identify uh, in labor women with preterm birth that potentially should have been referred out and not even been born in those facilities. So that may have uh, introduced some bias. Uh, there's potential for sex selection bias. And of course, I've mentioned the health worker strike in Kenya, which um, really required us to both lengthen the period of time of our trial and had implications on the health worker turnover and the fact that they made a sort of the consistency of some of the training and the interventions might be, we had to repeat some of them. So why, why did it why did it work? What do we think? And the, the in-country collaborators have really, we've done a lot of thinking about that. And we think it's sort of this combination of that if you take a problem like preterm birth, you define it, you make it visible. Um, as I said at the beginning, people didn't really care about preterm birth, they cared about neonatal death. Through the course of this, it became a visible and real problem. The leadership locally were engaged and interested. Um, they saw the data um, in these QI collaboratives. They saw it emerging. And really the focus of things like the, the both the Pronto simulation is about team training and the QI collaboratives 
both worked synergistically such that this idea of taking ownership of your facility and the quality of care that you are providing to your community. So again, the intervention package, you can see the primary outcome. And if you're interested in reading more about it, it's in an article in Lancet Global Health that came out in July. Um, for those of you who are looking for capstones, um, there's over 100,000 births that we have data on. We have a few ongoing analyses and a number of sub-studies that we've been doing, but we're looking very carefully at the cesarean sections and what happens with outcomes to, for women who get cesarean sections. We're looking at the cost effectiveness of the entire package. We're doing a follow-up of neurodevelopment for these preterm infants. And then some of the other analyses, and again, maybe some of you might be interested, were, um, were very curious about the uh, mothers and the babies that were referred and what can we learn from looking carefully at the referral practices. It looks as though there's quite a bit of variability between the facilities. As I said, there was um, 20 facilities plus three referral facilities that we have data for, and looking at some of the differences and nuances between um, what are facility-based characteristics that may be um, creating an enabling environment for a greater impact or less. And again, looking more closely at those evidence-based practices for preterm infants, particularly KMC and antenatal corticosteroids. Um, one final thought before we move to Rwanda, um, and this is just one of these fun bits of data that we have uncovered, which has really started to change the way our in-country partners, the ministries, the providers are thinking. And what does this represent? This shows that the birth weight of the baby, so we have 500 grams to 999 on the far left, and versus the biggest baby on the far right, greater than 3,500 grams. And you see in the orange, the proportion that were discharged alive. And I really just wanna draw your attention to those very small babies, 500, less than 1,000 grams. So that's basically around less than two pounds that were discharged home alive. Now we're not talking about a lot of babies, but these are babies that were born into facilities without um, neonatal intensive care. There's really basic newborn care with some um, newborn care unit and special care unit, but without all of the bells and whistles you imagine in an intensive care unit. And the fact that even some of those babies did not die is really shifting a bit the paradigm of what providers in these settings think they can do. Uh, most providers believe that babies less than a thousand grams, which are usually less than 28 weeks will not survive. And in fact, any baby that is less than 28 weeks born as a stillbirth is considered an abortion. It isn't even listed as a birth if it's not alive. So that's sort of one of the interesting points that has sort of shifted um, the provider's impression of what they actually can do and the, the, um, the confidence they have in actually trying to um, do the best for these babies. Okay. Deep breath, and then we're going to talk for about another 10 minutes or so about the Rwanda project, and then we'll have some, quite a bit of time for um, question and answer, I think. So, as I said, the initiative had two big implementation trials, the one I just spoke about in Kenya and Uganda, and the second one was an, another implementation trial looking at the impact of group antenatal care on preterm birth. Now, this group antenatal care trial um, comes out of some evidence in high income settings that showed that, um, well, a 2015 review of group antenatal care. Now, what is group antenatal care? That is changing the model of delivering antenatal care so that instead of a woman going in and having a one-on-one -on -one visit with a midwife or a nurse or a doctor, women are um, matched women of similar gestational age and they meet up in a group of about 10 women and they have a group visit. So there was a review of this and this, this model is getting a lot more attention recently. Um, it has been shown that women like this model and there was some data or in the Cochrane review that showed that overall there was no effect on preterm birth. However, among um, women in high risk groups, there was a decrease in preterm birth rate and there was an increase in the number of women that had um, more than five visits. Uh, 
There's also has been, this has been picked up more and more in low and middle income countries. There's been some feasibility and acceptability data in Ghana and Tanzania. Uh, recent um, cluster randomized controlled trial in Nigeria that showed that the group care model led to a higher proportion of women that decided to deliver in the facility and an increase in the number of women that got four plus antenatal care visits. And four plus until recently was considered the standard for quality of care in, or the quality antenatal care visits. So we decided, and this was because the Rwandan Ministry of Health and our academic partners really wanted to focus on prevention of preterm birth. So Kenya and Uganda was really on survival of preterm infants in the context of all infants. This work was really around, could we decrease the proportion of women that have a preterm birth by providing um, group antenatal care? Uh, the Rwandan uh, team that created the model with support from us for maintaining the fidelity to the core principles of group care, insisted it be a four visit model. And as I mentioned, WHO has recently, during the course of the trial, indicated that actually antenatal care is probably more effective as a, an eight contact um, model, but this was four visits. And you can see um, how those visits were organized and it included one postnatal group visit at, as well. Um, this was a even more complex forearm trial. I'm not gonna focus on the forearms, I'm gonna focus on the two arms, but here we selected 36 health centers in five districts in Rwanda um, to look at the primary intervention, which was comparing standard one-on-one -on -one antenatal care with group antenatal care. And then the secondary intervention, again, driven by our local partners, was they wanted to see what impact would there be to introducing ultrasound and urine pregnancy testing done by community health workers. So you can see that in each of the primary intervention arms, there were half of the facilities that either received ultrasound and, and urine pregnancy testing or did not. So those were, they, um, Ultrasound was not previously done at this level of care. So in half the facilities, we also trained midwives to conduct early ultrasound for um, particularly for gestational age dating. Um, so what was our hypothesis for this trial? Our hypothesis here was that group antenatal care and women presenting for antenatal care less than 24 weeks, so they we needed to have, um, it couldn't be very late gestation, that wouldn't make sense, who attended at least two visits at the study um, health facilities would increase gestational age at birth by half of a week compared to women who receive standard care. Again, the theory of change is that if you imagine you get women to come in early for antenatal care, you increase the opportunity to screen and treat for um, risk factors, and you increase, uh, have a greater chance of increasing the health um, literacy of the um, women and improve connection and support will lead to this early identification and the potential to, de to improve, to decrease the um, preterm, the incidence of preterm birth. Again, I've got to have the consort diagram that gives you a sense of um, where all the numbers come from. In the end, we determined gestational age at birth among almost 9,000 mother-baby pairs. Um, as I said, there were 36 facilities, pair-matched, randomized, and in the end, we had um, over 4,000 babies in each group that were eligible for the primary outcome analysis, which was gestational age at birth that you see at the bottom there. Uh, what were these facilities like? This is sort of a representative um, clinic in Rwanda. These facilities provide antenatal care. They provide 24-hour obstetric care. They do not provide cesarean section care. Those women need to be referred. And they have about 11 nurses. Um, they're primarily rural settings. And you can just sort of um, imagine, you know, what it's like there in this image. So again, when we think about um, assessing the outcome, you have to also be able to know, well, we set out to do antenatal care. When we set out to do that, what data do we have to show that it happened the way we expected it to happen? Did the women 
who were assigned to the group care uh, arm of the trial actually get group care the way it was designed. And as you can see that we had, you know, a total of almost 3,000 group visits in which we had data to assess sort of fidelity to the model. On average, they had nine women per group. So we didn't want them to say they had two women. We didn't want it to be 20 women. And so that was consistent with the way the model is designed. And most of the visits were about two hours. And this is the way similarly consistent um, to what it is. There's usually a health assessment in the beginning that took up to about an hour, followed by this hour um, group discussion on a predetermined topic. But the facilitators are trained to know to be also led by the discussion from the um, women in the group. Um, some of the master trainers uh, observed uh, many of these visits so we could get a sense of the fidelity, which was quite high to the model. However, unlike our Kenya-Uganda model, this is the reality of implementation trial, though the hypothesis sounded good and there was some evidence that this might work, we found it did not have a significant on, pre on preventing preterm birth. You can see that the preterm birth rate in the control group was 3.6%, and the intervention, 3.7%, no difference. And these are the preterm birth rate, and you can see the gestational length in weeks um, was also similar. So um, now, although we had hoped to show a difference, it also provides some important data to, um, if we believe in this, that certainly uh, settings in which they have a high burden of preterm birth, it does not look like this is a, um, promising intervention to actually impact that. Now, that doesn't mean that this isn't an important intervention. I just, however, <laughs> um, it also did not have an, a significant impact on a number of other secondary outcomes. Uh, you can see the first one, the proportion of women who attended four antenatal care visits uh, was not significantly different. The proportion of women who came in early to antenatal care. We thought maybe more women as time went on would come in early in the intervention facilities because they liked this model of care, so they would come in early. And we also found that uh, attendance at the postnatal visit, if anything, decreased in the intervention group. And we can talk a little bit about that, but I think it has to do with the burden we put on the women um, to come back at a specific time and place. Um, way before they were able to predict when they might be available to come back. So showed no measurable benefit, but there were some limitations that um, warrant um, noting because um, they always impact these sorts of things. Um, one is again the, the possibility of misclassifying preterm birth and how we assess gestational age. Um, there were a number of measures, but there was a relatively small proportion of women who actually had ultrasound, which is the best means to assess preterm birth and accurately assess gestational age. And you may have remembered that I mentioned that the Cochrane Review showed impact among high-risk women. If we looked carefully, although Rwanda is an LMIC, the women, the characteristics of the women in the trial were actually quite low risk. And as you saw, the, the proportion of women with preterm birth was quite small. Um, there were significant workload and staffing obstacles, and there was um, factors around the intervention dose that was sub suboptimal, um, that, that all of this may be impacting the, the results in the end. Um, we did notice, and these are a couple of, of quotations from the qualitative work we conducted around this, and you see on the left side, so basically, what are these challenges? The challenges are that um, this is putting an extra stress on an already um, fragile system, so here you can see that you know, it happens that you may be urgently needed, this is an ANSI provider, in a different service while you're supposed to be giving the group antenatal care, thus you're obliged to excuse yourself for an absence of a little while and provide the services called for. Um, so that was not satisfying for either the providers or the women that were receiving that care. And um, this, the other uh, quotation on the right that you can read um, lets you know that 
you know, we gave women days and times they were supposed to come back. Many women have to um, walk a long way to get to the clinic and they can't really be so predetermined in how and when to come to the antenatal care visit. So it wasn't a drop-in model or a, you know, come in for your ANC visit on the Tuesdays and you'll get care. We really specified day and time and that was difficult for many women to, um, to stick with. Um, there were a number of secondary benefits uh, to, to this. You know, the women really like group care and they really like it because as, um, as spoken by one of the ANC providers is that, um, I'll just go to the very end about the group care program, is that she, um, meaning the patient, considers you as a sister rather than a health center employee. So it really transforms the relationship between the provider and the women. And then on the right, you see this quote, which really shows how um, the magic of ANC is creating a sense of community between the women who are participating. And they share their stories, and they're the ones that are um, encouraged to provide advice and counsel um, to each other um, with the support of the provider that is there facilitating. And clearly, um, women appreciated this and wanted more of it. So again, in this trial, so similarly, we have a lot of data now. Um, there are about 25,000 women that we have data on that we're continuing to look at. Uh, we're looking at analyses around maternal mental health. This is one of the insights. I believe I have a slide next that will show you um, how there may be an impact of group care on um, maternal depression scales and feeling of depression. And we're also looking at what are the factors around whether or not women return. Uh, we have some indicators around how they were treated. So were that, was it sort of person-centered care? We have a few measures of that. Uh, what appears is they're not so important. What is really important about whether women come back is whether or not they talk to their partner about the pregnancy. Um, some analyses that we still need to conduct is, again, looking at the variability in outcomes among um, health centers compared to hospital deliveries. And by that, I mean, you know, these 25,000 women, a proportion of them delivered in the facilities where they got their care and a proportion of them delivered or were referred to hospitals to have their care. And looking at sort of the difference between whether those were indicated referrals, where they're more or less in the intervention or control groups. Um, again, there's, there's quite a bit of interesting things also related to um, that secondary intervention that I mentioned around ultrasound and urine pregnancy testing. We have a, a DRPH student from Berkeley who's been doing quite a bit of work looking at that component of adding ultrasound too. Um, this is just the slide I was mentioning that says a little signal around whether group care improves maternal mental health. When women were enrolled in the study, uh, there was a survey and part of that survey was the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale. Uh, now, this was done antenatal, so it's not, the validity is somewhat questionable, but again, it's a signal when you look at the proportion of women who scored high um, antenatally and postnatally, 20% with a drop to postnatally 9.7 um, in the control and in the intervention, you see that actually, um, the drop, they both dropped, but the um, degree of the decrease was greater in the group antenatal care group. So again, we're thinking this warrants some further investigation. So overall, just to sort of give you a couple of closing reflections about this, um, with regard to the Kenyan Uganda package, I think this idea that local ownership and partnership around how to um, implement the research, what to do, what was involved in the packages was really critical to designing a study that was um, impactful and really um, taken up by the local uh, system. I think the other take home message is we truly believe that preterm lives can be saved by focusing on basic care around the time of birth. Um, there is sort of a parallel movement to get some of these high-tech technologies at in 
uh, low cost, low tech forms. But I think that we certainly believe that focusing on basic care is an important sort of scaffolding on which to layer new technologies if that's the way of the future. And our package had this synergistic approach such that our quality improvement collaboratives and our pronto training really work together to cause what we like to think of as of a transformation in the culture of care. And then just for the group antenatal care trial, um, we see that prevention of preterm birth is multifactorial and complex. The women in Rwanda like group care, there's no question. And if we are going to look at interventions around um, that may be acting through antenatal care, they really need to be of sufficient intensity and dose to um, be able to impact both women and providers' behaviors. And I think we were sufficiently able to impact provider behavior in the Kenya Uganda package, and there was something that was probably missing, and I think it had a lot to do with dose because of that's the way we had to design that project. Um, we're continuing to grow. There's all sorts of work in the other aims that I haven't even mentioned. Um, and I'm happy to have any of you reach out, have conversations about what kind of work we're doing in other areas. There's work in other countries and um, all around maternal newborn care that if you're interested, I certainly am more than happy to have a Zoom conversation with any of you. Just want to acknowledge our funders. Um, and more in our advisory boards, ministries of health, and more than anything, uh, the women, children, families, facility staff, mentors, and all the people that did the work um, to make this program a success. And that's the end of my presentation. I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Walker, for a truly magnificent presentation. You were able to summarize so much information and data into a succinct and beautiful presentation. I love your slides. And also your um, very good in providing uh, in a calm voice and very uh, didactically um, all of this information so that we can uh, understand uh, the terms and uh, the design, the theory of change, and the methods and the results. So um, we're inviting uh, everyone in the audience to pose your questions in writing in the Q and A icon of the Zoom platform. Um, Anna Mueller and I will be um, proposing some questions to begin with, and uh, then we will open to the audience. So let me invite my colleague uh, Anna Mueller to pose the first uh, few questions for Dr. Dillis Walker. Thank you, Jaime, and thank you, Dillis, for that presentation. Uh, my first question for you is, were there concerns that the modified safe childbirth checklist and the birth registry data would be an added burden to health workers and those collecting the data? And if so, how was this addressed? Great. Thanks, Anna, for that question. And I hope others of you in the audience are thinking about hard ones as well. So um, I, those are two components. One is the maternity register. So the maternity register is a log in every labor and delivery unit across the world. And whether it's electronic or in paper, the provider that delivers a baby is really required to fill it out. So that was not a new tool. It is something we just strengthened. Um, I don't think it was considered an added burden. In fact, I think they got some satisfaction over seeing us transform those numbers they filled out in this register into something meaningful that they could follow their progress on, which, which wasn't what was done previously. The same was not true for the Safe Childbirth Checklist because that was a new tool that was a, you know, a piece of paper, a checklist they're supposed to go to, through, and it's supposed to help guide their behavior and their practices and, and pick up um, problems. It has four components to it. One that they do when they admit a woman, 
one they fill out just before the baby's born, one they fill out right after the baby's born, and one they fill out when the, the woman's about to go home. We, we followed, monitored how often they were filled out and how well they were filled out, and it wasn't that well. Okay, so clearly it was an added burden to them. And it looked like, you know, if we were to do this again, we would probably keep only the pause point on admission, the very first one, and the one after the birth of the baby. And I think that both of those are sort of critical times and the providers clearly, there were spikes in, in the use of the checklist at that point. I'm curious, uh in, in one of the slides, uh, you mentioned the strike of uh, nurses in, in, in Kenya. And you did mention also that that uh, prolonged the length of the study. Um, so can you comment uh, on efficacy and effectiveness? What are the challenges uh, in the real world when you implement such a complex study? Yeah, thank you for that question. And I think, you know, particularly for students, this is a really important concept to understand. So efficacy is when you want to know whether something works or doesn't work, and you tend to do a randomized controlled trial. You can do it in one hospital and you say, if I'm in a hospital and these women randomly get this and these women don't, I will see whether the efficacy, whether it works or not. Effectiveness, on the other hand, transformed what you know already should work. So you do an effectiveness trial when you have something that already has some efficacy measures. Like you wouldn't invest in the kind of trial we did if there wasn't already efficacy data that Pronto works, QI Collaboratives works. Um, some of these other things work in very um, controlled settings and environments. What you do is you sort of set it free in the real world and look at measures to see whether it still works when you take away all of that rigor um, behind it. And we were forced to confront the problem of the strike. So that, you know, dropped our numbers of women were not delivering in facilities for seven months. And there was a huge influx of women that were delivering in the few missionary hospitals. So there were a couple of hospitals that um, were mission hospitals and they had huge spikes in their care and we had to kind of account for what was happening with this shifts. That meant that a lot of the providers that got trained in these things left. They just left the facilities, never came back. So seven months later, we've already done all this training. There had to be decisions made and controlled for how much do we have to repeat or not to show whether this works. So yeah, this difference between efficacy and effectiveness is really a nuanced and important one. Anna? Yeah, thank you, Dallas. Uh, my second question for you is, how did you account for variance in gestational age, particularly in a setting where ultrasound is not part of the routine care for the mother? Ah, not very well is probably the most honest answer. And I, through the course of this work, whenever I now read any papers around preterm birth and LMICs, I both question um, question it in terms of the way we question our gestational age assessment, and I even question it in settings where they introduce early ultrasound to accurately assess gestational age, because that in and of itself is an intervention. So if you're going to start doing a trial of something else and you want to measure gestational age, if you have introduced ultrasound to do that, you're impacting it. So you're, it's not really effectiveness again, it's, it's a, it's, you're measuring something different. We ended up looking very carefully at our gestational age measures. Turns out if you have one woman who have, gives birth in a facility, you have gestational age that you look at her chart, you look at the maternity register. She has gestational age that is listed, she, she, you have her last menstrual period, so that's the day of her last period, and you can calculate when you think her, her birth date should be and where she is relative to that, that's one. You have a gestational age that is um, written down by um, the, uh, the calculated gestational age, which should be based on LMP. You have a gestational age that is assessed after the baby is born. That's kind of called the best obstetric estimate, where the midwife looks, has this baby, looks at it and says, oh, you know, before the baby was born, I wrote down that this baby was 34 weeks, but look, it's, 
It's three kilos. This isn't a 34 week baby. I'm going to write 38 weeks here. And we did a lot of look. So with any one woman, you could have three and then you have their chart, which might have even a different measure. So you have to be very careful about, you know, which one do you believe? We did some assessment of which of those gestational age measures um, are in greatest accordance with national norms about gestational age and birth weight that fall within these curves. And we found that the one that was looked most accurate was the best obstetric estimate where the midwife looks at it. But we also recognized that, you know, about 95% of babies less than 2,500 grams are preterm. So we said, okay, we're just gonna take all those small babies. And then we're gonna take those that are late preterms, so less than 3,000, if it's over 3,000, it's very unlikely to be a preterm, that had some measure of gestational age less than 37 weeks. I'm curious, uh, dear Liz, to ask you um, about um, cost effectiveness. 34% uh, reduction is uh, absolutely amazing. I mean, it proves that uh, this is something that works even in uh, challenging conditions, in uh, low income settings. It uh, sounds like this should uh, go scale up. Um, do you have a sense of what is the cost of uh, death averted? And uh, are you planning to do some cost effectiveness analysis? Um, absolutely, and that is being led by a graduate of the IGHS master's program, Carolyn Smith-Hughes, who did her master's capstone on a cost-effectiveness study in, I believe it was Zimbabwe, is now sort of reapplying those skills she learned as a master's student to do the analysis of our cost-effectiveness for this trial. Um, we're expecting to have that data in the next couple of months. Certainly the ministries are very interested in learning that. Um, what is interesting about the way she's doing that analysis is, is you can imagine there's cost effectiveness for doing this trial as a research and what you need to do to do the research around it. Um, and then there's the cost of just, if you're just gonna implement it and you have to take away all of the things we did because it was research, how much would it cost? And then there's a cost that we're estimating about sustaining it. Okay, so with any of these kinds of quality improvement interventions, you often see decay and, and, and that happens. And what we're trying to do is estimate what kind of investment would, it, would be needed based on what we know, particularly about data, quality improvement, pronto, the checklist, we have less kind of confidence in its impact in this whole thing. But what kind of dose do you need on a long-term basis and what might that cost for a health system? I think, Anna, you have a follow-up question on that, right? You, yeah, going off of the cost-effectiveness question, what are some sustainability and scalability strategies for the Pronto uh, training? Um, yeah, it's, um, it's actually really exciting to see what's happening to Pronto. So this program that Jaime mentioned that we developed really um, based on this need in Mexico of, you know, what are we going to do about um, quality of care and where's a good program and we said this is the answer the Mexican government paid for us to develop the program the Mexican government paid for us to do the trial and it is now being implemented basically in 10 countries around the world I think it might be 12 even now and it's been transformed in terms of the sustainability from a program that was designed initially as these modular courses to a program that is really an add-on to existing capacity building programs. Okay, so many systems have, whether they're mentors, they're EMONC training, they're trainers that are supposed to go out. What we're doing is adding on this simulation and team training component and curriculum and teaching preferably existing mentors how to do it, how to use it, and how to implement it at a really local basis. So our, the strategy for sustainability is less about developing new content for the simulations and more about training local people to be able to do it themselves on an ongoing basis and take some core tools and then 
grow and expand it on their own. You know, we're currently negotiating with the, the ministry in Kenya to try to get it into their national um, basic emergency obstetric care program. And we're pretty far along that line. We'll see if we actually get there, but the idea is to actually integrate it into the national program there. We, we are beginning to get some questions from the audience and I invite the audience to pose their questions in the Q&A icon. Um, Kate from Meta um, says, uh, thanks for this great presentation. Do you know if group care in Rwanda continued after the study period? Was provider satisfaction measured? Yes, so um, great question. Thank you, Kate. Uh, Provider satisfaction was measured. So we did a lot of qualitative work with providers. They enjoyed providing care in this way. They felt that the care that they provided was more patient-centered, it was more rewarding, um, it was more meaningful to them. That said, there's no question it was an additional strain. You know, Anna asked the question, was the modified safe childbirth a, a strain? Group care, introducing this new model was a strain and without introducing new human resources, this expectation that um, you know, the, the midwife could spend her two hours um, focused on the group care meant that her other duties were actually lagging behind and or she was jumping out of the group care to do, do, go do those things. And I think that that is something that for long-term sustainability really needs to be recognized. Um, in those facilities where the group care was done, the group care, the, the entire facility shifted over to group care. Um, some of them are some still doing it. Um, there's similarly to um, issues in any of these things. Once you lose a nurse who knows how to do the group care, you're stuck with, with um, losing that. I think that what the ministry in Rwanda is doing is exploring how to use group care combined with additional visits to, to, to modify their model to be a combined group care and community health worker contacts to reach the eight visit model. I think one of the things I didn't mention that was unique about our group care model is that it was co-facilitated. We trained a midwife from the clinic and the community health worker, a local community health worker, to be co-facilitators of the group care. And there's a whole lot of information we have about what that did to the community health worker and how much they learned through the process and how that transformed their role also within the community. Anna, do you want to pose the next one? Yeah, actually, my next question for you is, is one that uh, Nicole Santos just posted. So I'll, I'll read her question. Uh, for the Kenya and Uganda study, can you talk about maintaining gains given the COVID-19 pandemic, not just the gains in neonatal preterm survival, but also gains in provider confidence and skills? Um, so those are two different questions. Nicole, I should probably make you answer that question <laughs> as you pose the most difficult one. Um, the COVID pandemic has really disrupted everyone everywhere. Um, as I might have mentioned earlier, this group that I'm, this advisory group to the Director General of WHO is looking at this globally. And the issues around COVID and um, routine service provision are still emerging. So not only has it impacted um, nurses and midwives and their fear of going to work, it's impacted um, women and uh, fear of having their babies in their facilities. It's, it's impacting everything to a degree we, we don't even know. However, you know, through this group where we've been looking at, okay, what are the direct impacts of COVID on pregnant women? There are probably some we're continuing to learn, but it's a little bit different than the H1N1 flu, which was really impactful to pregnant women. Um, that's direct. Then there's the indirect on these services that women aren't going to antenatal care, women don't want to have their babies in the facilities, providers are afraid to be in the facilities that they might get infected. What's happening there? Um, and then there's this new transition to, are some of the mitigation strategies that these systems are putting into place actually mitigation strategies that can improve quality of care and should be sustained. So by that I mean 
um, it shouldn't, it's not fair for a hundred women to come to antenatal care visits over four hours and be lined up next to each other for four hours. It's actually improves care to, to spread them out. How can we encourage systems to maintain those changes they're making? Similarly around the, the um, sort of how women are as in that picture I showed, how closely they're packed in in these maternity wards. If they actually make changes to improve that, those could be maintained um, long-term. Nicole, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, thank you, Dylan. Um, I see two new questions at it. Uh, one comes from Betty. Uh, she thanks you for this great session, first of all. And then she asked um, whether you are and the Rwanda country authorities planning to implement this group care in a larger scale, I mean countrywide. Uh, what will be done in terms of uh, sustainability and affordability for mothers not to miss their appointments? Um, yeah, okay, so there's a couple of questions in there. The first one about um, on national scale. Um, the other thing that was good about the group care trial is um, the COPI in Rwanda leads the maternal, the maternal health unit within the ministry and was very engaged in the research throughout the whole period. I think he was disappointed as we all were in the finding on preterm birth. So I think they were pretty ready if they found an outcome that was convincing on one of their significant primary or secondary indicators, they would be pretty ready to, to, to scale. Our data actually put a bit of a damper on that. And I think it made them realize more than anything that probably this four visit model isn't enough. You know, what can you expect out of four visits? And they're really trying to look, as I mentioned before, at a hybrid model where they can bring in um, uh, this whole idea of eight contacts and in incorporate group care. So the actual model that they originally developed is not probably going to be implemented at scale until it's adapted to an eight contact model. Um, the other part of that question, I've forgotten. Um, there was a second part about... I no longer have it in front of me. Um, that was the first part. The second... the second part asks, what will be done in terms of sustainability and affordability for mothers not to miss their appointments? Right, okay, so that is where a great question equally because it was a burden on those women and I think other there are other um, researchers and there's some interest among us to look at can you get benefits by allowing women to to come in similarly on a kind of a drop-in schedule that they don't the, the problem with our model was that they came in for the visit they got enrolled in this the study in the group care model and they got their four visit dates and time at that moment including their postnatal visit. Okay, so how can you schedule that that far in advance? Lesson learned. And so changing from these assigned visits with the same group of 10 women, could you actually get similar community creation if they were actually different configurations of women each time? And you just came in once a month and you met in a group, but they may not be the same women and they may not be at the same gestational age. That may be more person-centered thinking about the woman um, and, you know, we may be able to get similar results or better results. We only have time for a couple of questions more. Um, Anna, why don't you take uh, the last one from Tanvi and I take now the one from an anonymous attendee. So this uh, is uh, about thanking you for a wonderful presentation, very interesting. Um, he or she is uh, concerned about the members of this panel that even though the work was done in Uganda and Rwanda, none of the panelists is from these countries or not even from Sub-Saharan African. So, sad. Um, 
I would I love to say. comment on that. And I am so glad somebody brought that up. Um, we had long discussions about that among our group. Um, our initial launch of the results for these studies were done um, basically by our in-country principal investigators. Um, so I think many of you online probably weren't around, but we did have another webinar where we um, released the results and it was um, really led by our in-country partners. We felt it was sort of unfair and they, you know, noon UCSF time is um, late at night for our collaborators in Kenya. Um, that's, this is when IGHS Grand Rounds are. Um, we are certainly running right now, you know, this is just one presentation of many, many that the Preterm Birth Initiative is hosting. Most of those are being led by our in-country partners and we're sort of um, actively trying to play a supporting role. We've recently developed a part partnership with the East African, East Central African Health Community who are going to host a series of webinars that we're gonna be the backup to kind of help coordinate them um, with our in-country PIs um, leading and running those. So thank you for that question. Thank you, Dillis, for addressing that. Um, and I guess this can be our last question from Tanvi. She's, she or he says, um, Hi, Dr. Walker, thank you for such an amazing presentation. I think you briefly discussed this, but can you speak about some barriers women face in attending their antenatal care visits and whether your study has data on that? Um, we, okay, so some of the barriers for antenatal care, there are many. One is the quality of that antenatal care visit um, may not be anything that that woman appreciates because the, she spends five minutes with the midwife. So the content of the care is one thing. The setting of the care is another. Many of the women have to stand in line and wait for two hours before they get their five minute visit. Many of these are women are taking care of their, their children at home, their um, fields at home, they're working at home. So we really expect them to come. Um, once a month or even more than that to spend half a day in the clinic is really not reasonable or fair. Um, so there are numerous barriers to um, being to, to women. In terms of what did we um, get on this, we have a quite a bit of qualitative work where we compared women's experience of care in the group and the standard antenatal care model. So we were able to kind of document many of these things and you saw some of that in the quotes that I presented. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you again so very much, uh, Delis. This was uh, truly exceptional and uh, it's uh, about time uh, we need to um, finish this uh, with a round of applause to you. Very well done. And all of the wonderful collaborators in uh, Rwanda, Uganda, and Kenya you have. Um, next uh, presentation in the COVID-19 series will be done by Dr. Monica Gandhi on Tuesday, October 27. So thank you all again for attending these grand rounds and hope to see you in the next COVID-19 series. Goodbye and be safe. Thank you. Thank you.